Welcome to Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and creatives, brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding, Director of the Centre. I'm also a full-time author. So in today's podcast, I decided to look at the difference between war as it appears in books and the film versions that we all may have seen. I'll be taking key examples such as The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Narnia stories, but we'll also be calling in on famous war writers such as Tolstoy and Thackeray and the writers from the First World War. So it's a massive subject, obviously won't cover it all, um, but we will be taking a few highlights just to think about how we approach war as creatives and in fantasy. I've also written about war myself in both historical fiction and fantasy and so towards the end I'll be reflecting on the lessons I've learnt and my own experiences when writing on this subject. Why did I choose this particular subject today? Well, that was because if you are listening to the podcast you'll know that I've made my way through the Andy Serkis reading of The Lord of the Rings. And the funny thing that happens when you listen to something that you're very familiar with when you read it is that you really see the details come to you afresh. And that's what was happening for me. And I wanted to have another look at some of the details about war in particular that you find in the text as written by Tolkien, as opposed to the versions you may have seen Uh, like the BBC audio version and, of course, much more famously, the Peter Jackson Massive Trilogy. So here are a couple of things which are different if you've only watched the films. And I hope that mentioning some of these will encourage you to go away and have a look at the, the original source, the book itself. So I think that one of the things that you see really clearly in the books is that Tolkien understands his Middle-earth conflict as a world war. There are lots of battlefields, not just the ones that are featured in chapters. There's rumours of wars happening in many places and reports of skirmishes and defeats. It's been going on for a while. It's not just the events of the Lord of the Rings. And I think that all goes to make the sense of the war much more um, realistic than you find in many Um, fantasy series that perhaps the person hasn't had the experience of living two world wars, which was the experience of Tolkien's generation. The first one, he was a combatant, uh, famously living through, fortunately, living through the Battle of the Somme, unlike many of his contemporaries. And then again, as a father with sons away at war in the Second World War, when he was writing Lord of the Rings itself, And you can imagine him tuning in to um, the BBC News, listening to the speeches of Winston Churchill and having a great sense of the theatre of war. And his book manages to convey that same breadth and scope and the number of people involved, which is, I think, really unique for a fantasy series. The other thing which I was reminded of is how his version of the battlefield itself is actually much more realistic than what you might see in what I would call the CGI'd version. Um, Though the visuals in the Peter Jackson films are splendid, I'm not knocking them at all, and they were very much at the cutting edge of what is possible in terms of what you can do in CGI. They also have been simplified for clarity. So if you remember, you've got Minas Tirith, the city rising out of the plain, and then not much else. It's as though no human activity happens outside the walls. Clearly, we don't experience cities like that. There are roads coming and going, there are farms, there are cottages. Uh, As Erwin says about the Westfold, Rick Cotton Tree, you know, there's lots more out there. And so when you approach the battle in the book, first of all, Gandalf with Pippin go through a defensive dike. So it's not just the the walls of Minas Tirith. There's a a sort of outer defences where they have a conversation with those who are repairing the wall. Uh, And then they also um, pass through the sort of fields and the the places where people live, which must be remembered 
uh, that usually the first casualties of war are the undefended farms and that kind of place. And when the um, forces of Sauron approach, there is mention of them digging trenches. As soon as you hear that word, you, of course, reminded of the vast battlefields of France in the First World War. And I think it'd be a really good and it would enrich our understanding of that Battle of Pelennor Field is to put that back in in our imaginations, that this is a complica- complicated landscape. Um, it's not just a vast plain where people are moving squares of companies of, um, you know, orcs and mumakil as if there is no other nothing else there but grass. So definitely a reason for reading the book. And I think it's also to honour Tolkien's own experience. The Battles of the Somme and previous and other encounters of the First World War ended up being in an obliterated landscape, but still there were what was left of the woods, what was left of the farmhouses, a ruined landscape, but one which he would have known intimately. And I think that gives it a more very similitude, the idea of it feels more real. The other major difference between what you may have seen and what you may read is there are many more characters involved. These cuts were made in order to have a manageable tale to tell. And that is what screenwriters often have to do when they're adapting such a big work. That's not the issue here. It's just saying why you should go back and read the book. So, for example, there are some wonderful minor characters in the two towers in the battle for Helm's Deep. It all happens slightly differently from what you've seen on the film. So Aylmer is there the whole time. He's not sent off like he is in the film. And the person who takes the role of Aylmer is another famous leader from Rohan called Erkenbrand, who gets his own little um, moment when he arrives with Gandalf. And it gives a sense of a much bigger society. It's not just Theoden and his nephew and niece. There's a whole world of Rohan, uh, minor leaders and other people. So you get a more complex society. It's not, it's as if the, um, it's not that only Churchill led the, (laughs) clearly, not only Churchill led the Second World War, but there were lots of other generals running campaigns, lots of other nationalities, lots of famous um, generals and marshals and what have you. And it's much more complicated, rich, nuanced. And then another section, this is a bit of a a list, but I hope you're ticking them off. And if you know the books well, you hopefully are adding your own list here. Um, But one thing I think was a great shame not to see in the film versions, which you do get in the audio version with BBC, is the arrival of the Grey Company. So this may be a complete mystery to you. What I'm talking about here is um, when... Pippin and Gandalf ride off after Pippin's looked into the Palantir. That's towards the end of the Two Towers section involving those characters. Aragorn's people from the north, the Dúnedain, the other people like uh, the rangers, arrive with the two sons of Elrond bearing a message. This replaces that rather odd moment where Elrond just pitches up with a sword um, If you think about it, some of those things make no sense at all. What's he doing down there? There's a war up north. You should be up there, Elrond. Anyway, I can see why, as a storyteller, they wanted to simplify it. But um, the Grey Company, as it's called, of Aragorn's own people ride to the rescue, which is important in terms of the politics, for those of you who are following the details of Tolkien's world, of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And it also makes the decision to walk the paths of the dead, which is... The message is brought with the Grey Company to suggest that this is, you know, remember the past of the dead, Aaron tells Aragorn. It makes it seem a more logical thing to do. So rather than three people go off, Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli go off on their own, you've got a small company, a small band riding through the area where um, the, the army of the dead are waiting. I think it's a beautiful passage. It's very well written. It's very powerful. Really worth listening on it. So, um, listening or watching, listening, I should not watching, listening or reading on, on its own because you've got both the perspective of those who are um, 
in that company, particularly Gimli and how scared he is and that feeling of visceral terror. But you also have the local inhabitants, glimpses into how they feel about this army of the dead who are riding through. It's very well written. I highly recommend it. And then now going into Minas Tirith itself. So we're in the events of the return of the king uh, by now with these episodes. You've got a couple of really wonderful minor characters. One of my favorite is Berigond, who is the, um, the person who introduces Pippin to the sort of being a captain of the guard in, uh, in service to Denethor. And he also says, if you're at loose end, go and find my son, Burgil. So then you've got this sort of lovely um, episode where Pippin, who has been through all of this, goes down and finds the few children left in Minas Tirith. And they, first of all, think he's a child. And then they think, oh, my goodness, he's really grown up. And then he says, actually, I'm still a child from my, according to my people, because I've not yet reached 33 in that wonderful way that the hobbits have different age, coming of age barriers. And this reminds us, I think, of the, the fact that societies aren't just these warrior types, uh, but you actually get to meet a child, you get to see the war from his perspective, you get to see the father who's um, got his son in the city under siege. And I think it's a wonderful humanising part of the story. And then finally, in this list of things I think is really makes a reason why you should go back and read the book, there is the character of Prince Imrahil. Now, you remember Faramir, also another brilliant character, um, when he rides out to defend the retreat from Osgiliath. Uh, they do, in the Peter Jackson film, there is the wonderful ju ju juxtaposition between Pippin singing his song and... Faramir and his people being more or less shot down. In the book, there's much more strategy. It's much less reckless than it appears in the film. Um, he goes out to guard the retreat. He also, Denethor, prepares a sortie to protect the, the returning soldiers led by Prince Imrahil and the cavalry. So, in fact, Faramir does stay to the end to protect the retreat of the few who have survived as Gileath. But he is carried in on Prince Imrahil's horse. He's collected as a fallen soldier from the battlefield. So he's not dragged by his foot by his horse <laughs> through the gate in that rather um, desperate way that you see in the film. And I think the difference here is that there is much more humanity, much more strategy, much more sense of all of Minister of Fighting rather than just a few. And Imrahil himself has a fascinating um, connection to elves. And there's a sense of, you could imagine, another story told from his point of view about Prince Imrahil. You know, it's great to think of these byways that weren't explored, but he's a wonderful little character to let your imagination loose on. Okay, so another reason for reading the book is as a lesson in how to deal with the complicated subject, which is a massive war. And I want to, again, focus again on the Battle of Pelennor Fields and the way the choreography of the writing is sorted. So what you've got here is largely the battle is approached from two sides. We get some prequel material with Aragorn going off to um, try and divert the attack by the Corsairs, but we don't know if he succeeds, it's held back as a surprise. So we're not told everything. And that's really important. That is reflected in the way the film handled it as well. But mainly we see the battle from inside Minas Tirith from the point of view of Pippin and the people who live there. And then the external, which is Merry coming with the, the riders of Rohan. And it's very, if you go back and have a look at it, the, the changes from one point of view to the other are very carefully done. So you're not given away that Rohan will arrive in time. Um, that's purposely held back uh, so that, again, you've got a surprise. 
And this is very cleverly done. It is actually quite a filmic thing that Tolkien was doing. He cuts between the two main storylines at this point. So as well as the overall view you get from the walls of Minas Tirith, where we see the battle arriving and the sense of the siege getting underway, those those very famous scenes from the, the films, you get those in the book too. But what you also get emphasised is the experience of the individual in it. So you go from the eagle-eyed back to the very local. And you've got a character like Pippin who is waiting on a steward who is going mad. And you've got Mary peeking out from behind Dernhelm's cloak. Um, and the need for to have these blinkers, this sort of narrow focus, is understandable because they're part of such a huge conflict that in order to make it feel as though you're there, you don't see it from a sweeping above eagle eye view. You see it from one person as who is part of that battle. And there's a comparison here to Tolstoy's is the first of our little sort of visits to <laughs> other writers. Um, War and Peace is actually my favourite war narrative. It, you may think it sounds like a really um, daunting book. It's it's only really long because think of it like a box set. There's lots and lots of stories. And towards the end of book one, we see an account of the Battle of Austerlitz. And when I read it, I thought this is amazingly handled. It's, it's done so that you go from the point of view of Napoleon up on a hill looking at it and you sort of tr travel from that strategic position down to one of the characters you've been following, who's Prince Andre, who's right in the midst of it, trying to be a hero. You know, he's, he's doing his best. Um, you go down to the point where you see some things which he can't, he glimpses images which he can't quite understand. Uh, so it says, for example, he could now see distinctly the figure of a red-haired gunner with his shako knocked awry, pulling one end of a mop while a French soldier tugged at the other. So it's, you know, it's got this absurd element where they're fighting over something which is not a war weapon. And it has that sense of the weirdness of war, the oddness of things that happen. Uh, and then he's um, actually, uh, well, he's wounded, plot spoiler, I'm sorry. Um, and it goes into his thoughts. What's this? Am I falling? My legs are giving way. And he, he's lying on the field, not understanding what's happened. Above him, there was now only the sky, the lofty sky, not clear yet, still immeasurably lofty, with grey clouds creeping softly across it. How quiet, peaceful and solemn, thought Prince Andre. And he he's fades out of consciousness. And then the next thing you do is you go back to the perspective that we started the battle with, with this Napoleon doing basically a ride through. And he, he sees this fallen um, soldier still holding the standard. And he says, oh, what a brave death. And then it's discovered that Andre is actually still alive and he's carried off uh, and left in a field hospital with those they don't expect to recover. So it's almost as if you're taking different camera angles, taking you all the way down from the very big to the individual who's losing consciousness and back out again. I mean, clearly Tolstoy is writing before cameras, but um, perhaps filmmakers learnt it from him. But it's a masterclass, as one would expect from such a classic, in how to write war. So sometimes there is so much going on, there has to be a selection. Uh, you notice there that Andre fades out of consciousness, and then you go to the post-battle scene. Tolkien, in the Battle of Pelennor Fields, does it with a song. It's his way of listing the dead. Uh, in this, it reminds us of those handful of um, extra characters who you only get in the, in the book, but it reminds us of the cost 
of war it's not that not just lots of every lots of people died let's move on not just feared and dying or any of you know that it keeps moving sometimes the films move so quickly you never really stop to think what is the cost and this way of pausing to remember the dead by a song reminds me a bit of the passage I mean, now we're going to go to Shakespeare here in Henry V, where he reads the names of the dead at the Battle of Agincourt. There's a moment when everything stops. It's like Remembrance Day. And in Tolkien's case, it's done beautifully through poetry. Um, and the a later, um, I suppose one thinks of it as a bard uh, from Rohan sings this song ends with this beautiful phrase that just hangs there, really bringing home the cost. And it says, Foam died with blood, flamed at sunset, as beacon mountains burned at evening. Red fell the dew in Ramus Echo. Ramus Echo is the area around the battlefield, basically. And the poetry of that allows the space for the sorrow, allows the space for the loss. And something similar happens um, in an earlier part, which again is mentioned in the, or is shown in the film version, where the enemy uses the heads of fallen soldiers as a kind of horrible, grisly um, missile. In the film version, it's just an ugh moment, you know, the shock horror of it. But in the book, it's dwelt on to allow the grief and pity. And Tolkien writes that some recognised the face of someone that he had known, who had walked proudly once in arms or tilled the fields or ridden in upon the holiday from the green vales in the hills. There's a sense of they're not just heads, they're not just sort of, you know, Madame Tussauds horror. They are people. And, of course, as many of you will know, Tolkien lost three of his four best friends during the First World War. So he absolutely knew this idea of that was someone I once walked proudly alongside in the fields. Um, and I think that the weight of that is allowed in those moments in the book, which don't make it into sort of film versions. But also looking at it as, uh, you know, creatives, Tolstoy let Prince Andre lose consciousness i'm pleased to say tolkien used the same technique but let's talk about now bilbo who spends much of the battle of the five armies unconscious it's quite funny to think that in the peter jackson version of the hobbit which i must admit isn't my favorite of his films the whole of the last film basically is a long extended version of what in the book is two pages so Bilbo sees the eagles arriving to help out like the airborne cavalry. The eagles cried Bilbo once more, but at that moment a stone hurtling from above smote heavily on his helm and he fell with a crash and knew no more. So poor old Bilbo misses most of the battle and he comes to to find out who won. So you don't, if you're thinking of how to handle a battle, there is a strategy of telling as much as you need to give a flavour and then checking out and coming back in again. The other thing um, that you can do is focus on characters who are, are not actually the main ones involved in the battle. So in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, for example, this is obviously writing for a much young you know, children's book, um, but still in the film treatment, the battle was huge. It was a big set piece with chariots and, you know, uh, lots of wonderful CGI characters all fighting. Um, but when you actually go and look at the, the book to see what they were using as their source material, you then find that actually the battle in Lion of the Witch and Wardrobe is very much a last minute thing because we spend most of the time with Lucy and Susan going to save the stone creatures in the White Queen's house and waking them up and then bringing them to help 
Peter and Edmund who are fighting the story. And you only get really a page or so of um, the onslaught as they arrive. And then you get um, some of the key moments in the battle told as a story in when they're healing, going around healing. And they hear who, what Edmund did, for example, is told like that rather than seeing it firsthand. So there's a use of the retrospect there. And the funny thing is, of course, as a child, is that I was left with the impression of a massive battle and I wasn't all aware of any lack. I think that your brain fills in things um, and runs with it. Prince Caspian um, also has a battle. You remember it starts as a um, a one-on-one combat and then there's some treachery and then there's a short battle, skirmish, and then it's over. Again, it all happens within very few pages. And that reminds me when I was sort of thinking of comparisons to this, <laughs> I'm going to go to another classic. It reminded me very much of um, Thackeray's Vanity Fair, which is the book in the sort of Victorian novel about um, the Battle of Waterloo. But actually, the Battle of Waterloo happens elsewhere. It's about the characters around, sort of arriving for it um, and the civilians who were waiting in Brussels. And Thackeray quite plainly states, I am not a military expert. You can, you've read accounts of the battle, he's telling his contemporaries. So that's not my subject. So sometimes what's around a war can be your subject matter as opposed to the complications of the specifics of battle itself, the fog of war stuff. And this idea of not necessarily sticking with the combatants um, suggested a nod towards another of the inklings. Uh, Charles Williams, who was a friend of Lewis and Tolkien and came to Oxford during the war uh, because he was evacuated from London. Uh, he was one of the Inklings and also one of the fantasy novelists amongst them. In fact, he was the first in print in that way. And his novel, War in Heaven, published in 1930, has an unusual view of combat. So Charles Williams himself suffered from poor health. And so during the First World War, he was in non-combat roles didn't go out to serve in the trenches like Lewis and Tolkien. But he also had a very idiosyncratic view. (laughs) He belonged to secret societies and sort of Rosicrucian uh, ceremonial groups. He's a fascinating man. Um, But anyway, his book, War in Heaven, is a bit like a kind of Indiana Jones story. It's all about the grail being found in a church in a country rectory and the baddies are after it a bit like they're after the ark of the covenant in the indiana jones story but the key conflict is actually one done as prayer there's like a prayer battle of the bad guys versus the good guys and this reminds me in the tolkien world of gandalf talking about striving in thought with Sauron, there's this element of it's your mental resilience that matters. And I suppose one of the things Charles Williams is saying there is that there is a role for those who, as um, they also serve who only stand and wait. That's a Milton quote. But the idea is that you can be a fighter, but in a different way. Anyway, the Charles Williams novels are sort of Maybe an acquired taste, but I think they're really worth a look at if you're interested in very, very different takes on fantasy. So we've adopted Charles Williams as an honorary Oxford writer, uh, though really he's a London-based writer, friend of T.S. Eliot and others. But one person who is absolutely an Oxford writer about war, a precursor to Apocalypse Now, is Alice uh, in Wonderland and Lewis Carroll, because obviously war is not always heroic. It's often strange, and it's funny, and it's absurd, and it's horrific. Uh, 
And you'll be pleased to know that Alice also has her thoughts on war, which come in mainly in Alice Through the Looking Glass, where she writes about trying to figure out the rules of battle. Alice Through the Looking Glass takes place on a large chessboard, so that has the idea of the two opposing armies. Alice says, I wonder now what the rules of battle are, she said to herself as she watched the fight timidly, peeping out from her hiding place. One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks him off his horse, and if he misses, he tumbles off himself. And another rule seems to be that they hold their clubs with their arms as, as if they were Punch and Judy. What a noise they make when they tumble, just like a whole set of fire irons falling into the fender. How quiet the horses are. They let them get on and off just as if they were at tables. Another rule of battle that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they always fell on their heads and that battle ended with their both falling off in this way side by side. When they got, again, got up again, they shook hands and then the Red Knight mounted and galloped off. It was a glorious victory, wasn't it, said the White Knight as he came panting. I don't know, Alice said doubtfully. I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be queen. So Alice has this sort of sense of, well, what are the rules? Everyone seems to be falling down and getting up again. So it's like a version of war that sees only its nonsensicalness, which is obviously the gift of Alice in Wonderland. Everything is nonsense in the end. So that's a, a take, a lampooning take on battle. Tolkien himself, I think, writes with a belief in the nobility of the cause of war, that even the smallest people, hobbits, uh, can achieve who, who don't have the chance to do the big feat of arms, but they can have huge impact. I'm not talking here so much Frodo and the Ring and Sam, but that's obviously absolutely key. But examples like Pippin saving Faramir, and all the consequences that would have tumbled from that if he hadn't questioned his orders. He was told to sort of shut up and put up by Denethor, but he says, no, um, you can't burn your son alive. He's not dead. So it's those moments of decision where the, the soldier works out what is the right thing to do that matter. Because of the cent centenary of the First World War, there were a number of books that came out about Tolkien and the Great War, um, John Gass one particularly of that title. And he compares Tolkien writing about war to the other famous war writers. And he says, such writers as Graves, Sassoon and Owen saw the Great War as the disease, but Tolkien saw it merely as the symptom. So there isn't the sense of war itself being the evil thing. It's the result of other factors. And within that, the, in the small hands can do the big deeds. There's another book about the war by uh, a friend of um, the Oxford Centre for Fantasy, Joe Leconte. His book, A Hobbit, A Wardrobe in the Great War, um, points out the difference between the two inklings, Lewis and Tolkien, and other writers of the interwar era, in that they put a value on humanity within the structures that fueled the Great War. Uh, clearly, Tolkien has a very dim view of leaders if they have power too long. Just take, for example, Saruman, Denethor, Sauron himself. And it's clear that within the war world, giving up is a virtue, giving up in the sense of giving up power. Um, so you've got Frodo, clearly, um, Bilbo, all those who choose not to take the ring, Galadriel, um, Gandalf, Faramir, all those who are given a chance who don't take the weapon. And another kind of giving up that's seen as admirable is like Arwen, who gives up eternal life in order to, for love. So there are other kinds of giving ups which are part of the ongoing um, struggle of humanity. And there's a sense of a belief in those decisions, uh, a value for them, which I think is very different from the more cynical take on war by those who, who reflected on it in the interwar period and perhaps are more 
um, associated with it, the sort of uh, war poets in particular. But I think this also brings us to another point, which is why we're all writing about war, because there is an awful poetry of war. So why you could read Lord of the Rings for a sort of version of the poetry of war, you clearly it's also important to read the contemporaries who were writing about war. Um, you must have heard of books like, by writers such as uh, Robert Graves or Ernest Hemingway, Vera Britton, uh, Heinrich Maria Remark from the German side. But one book I wanted to particularly mention, which I found really inspiring, was Sagittarius Rising by Cecil Lewis, which is a fascinating story of or autobiography of experience of the First World War, which focuses on the flyers. And he has a particularly poignant moment about the cruel cost of war, where he thinks about that moment when you come back from your flying sortie. And he says, the most self-confident aces began to wonder when their turn would come, faced by the empty chairs of men you had laughed and joked with at lunch. And miraculously, you were still there until tomorrow. There's other moments of pure poetry in his writing where he talks about the experience of looking down on the battlefield from the air and that separation between the flyer and the people down in literally the mud. So these writers all link back to the idea that war just as an action sequence is really not that interesting. It's about the feelings of being in that action that matter. And Definitely, that's something I've always found in Tolkien's writing. And you can feel that he has filtered his experience through his fantasy. And one of the aspects which I find particularly unique about him is the sense that war isn't a standalone event, but linked to others. Probably is a commonplace in uh, teaching history that when you do causes of the First World War, you look back to previous wars. Causes of the Second World War, you look back to the way the First World War was settled. All these interlinks. He puts that in there by showing us the previous battlefields. The Dead Marshes are a previous battlefield. Um, the Brown Lands. There's the sense that the present is always ha haunted by past defeats and short-lived victories. And the short year or so of the time within Lord of the Rings is one of those brief glimpses of sun, sunshine of a, what eventually is a victory. But one has a sense that it's bracketed by what is, in Tolkien's view, the long defeat. And that sense of history underlying the war, I think, adds to its realism. Okay, so I mentioned that I've also written about war myself. Now, I'm not never served in the armed forces or anything like that. So I have no personal experience of actually firing a weapon or any of those um, visceral war experiences. But parts of my career have involved understanding war. Um, so I worked in the Foreign Office at a time in a department, which was called the East Africa Department, when there were ongoing civil wars in Ethiopia and Somalia and still war-torn countries to this day and sort of was taught how to analyse what was happening. And then that's more of a political take. But then later on, I went to work for a development charity, Oxfam. And part of that was uh, the work I was doing there was about how to protect civilians living in war zones or close to war zones, and in particularly civilians who are displaced by war. And so that involved some travel to those areas. So I've always taken war very seriously, been extremely aware of the human cost. In the very, It's not a historical thing, it's an actual thing that many people today are living through. In my own writing, I, my first attempt at writing about war was in an epic fantasy called Dragonfly, um, which I've got the American cover for here. It's, I suppose, a more traditional take on the subject. I have a, a warlord called Spear, Spear Thrower, who has a kind of Roman, um, well, it's like a, a god of war type uh, ethos that he is following. And there, um, there is 
a war and a battle told through the main characters. But it's very important to me that one of the characters, her story arc follows what I learned from Tolkien, that often the greatest decisive events in a war are about giving up, giving up your own chance of life, giving up the chance of power. And that is where often the greatest courage is shown. So that's what I learned from Tolkien on that. And then I've also written historical fiction. I use a number of pen names. And as um, Eve Edwards, I've written a duet about the First World War, told from the point of view of teenagers you who are caught up in it. Um, it starts with dusk and the second part is dawn. And in the First World War, there is so many sources that you have the richness of material. I did as much research as I could. You could devote your whole life to trying to understand that war. But I, I did things like I went to battlefields, I went to museums, I went up in a tiger moth plane to get the experience of being a flyer. That's what took me to the uh, Cecil Lewis book, actually, an interest in the early aviators. I drew on written accounts also family memories, because my grandmother was a little girl during the war and she lived in London. And there was, in the First World War, an aerial um, attack. Aviation had got to the point where um, aircraft could reach the UK, which was a big psychological shift because the island nation always had felt insulated from war for many centuries. And now people of London were having bombs dropped on them and my um, grandmother told me a story of seeing a zeppelin and I put her account of this uh, great airship sort of moving silently over the rooftops of where she lived into that story and tried to capture her perspective looking up a small child looking up at this machine of war going overhead but the way of actually handling such a massive war I realized I had to narrow my focus I couldn't say everything. I would make mistakes for a start. So I chose the point of view um, where it was close to what, what's technically called third person close. So it's um, within the eyes of that character and limited to what they understood of the movements on the battlefield. So it wasn't the Tolstoy who was able to be Napoleon and the Russian commander and you know everybody else involved. Uh, I haven't got that skill. And so I chose an account of an officer in a specific regiment who wrote about his account of going up, um, going over the top at the Somme on the first day. And I stuck as close to his shoulder, more or less, as I could within what I needed for my own story. Something else which um, I've learned from reading about war in fantasy is about looking for new perspectives. And I wanted to, we haven't mentioned much here, the experience of women in war. Um, Tolkien gives us a warrior woman, um, in obviously marvellously in Erwin, but most mostly the women are evacuated and taken out of the war zone. And one writer who I think brilliant and should you know I highly highly recommend her is Tamora Pierce she writes fantasy set in that sort of Dungeons and Dragons world of knights and that kind of thing castles but she does really interesting angles on that material and one book in particular which I return to again and again is this one yeah the cover isn't my favorite I must admit um it's the fourth in her um series about Kel who is, by this time, she's become a lady knight. And Tamora Pierce has chosen to make Kel the overseer of a refugee camp. The story is constructed so that it is, of course, it's the, she turns out to be in exactly the right place to have a major effect on the war. But I love the, the granular detail that she goes into about running a refugee camp, down to the fact about who gets the du duty to do the latrines, how you protect it, what you do with civilians who aren't used to bearing arms, having to defend themselves because the resources aren't strong enough to send enough um, 
you know, men at arms to come and protect what is seen as an unimportant target. And I think this gives us an idea as people interested in fantasy about where new material might come from in writing about war. Because we have clearly lots and lots of big series like Game of Thrones and all those kind of things which do big campaigns and big wars. But actually to say what is the modern experience of war and look for parallels. So refugee crisis is clearly really important. Um, Resource wars, that will be something, I'm afraid, for the future. So um, we haven't come to the end of war as a subject for fantasy at all. I think perhaps we are just entering into a new era. I think the absolute key lesson in sort of conclusion here is that action is actually not the really exciting thing particularly in a prose version of it because that can just become overwhelming it's the experience of the person to whom the action is happening their exhilaration their fear their absurd thoughts their courage the pumping adrenaline the camaraderie yes and it's probably that last thing that is amongst the most important, the band of brothers and sisters that you go to war with, because it tells us that it's about love. To make us care, war narratives like The Lord of the Rings and War and Peace have to, in the end, be about the heart. From war horse to the war for the ring, you have to fight to save what you love. So that's a little thought about... <laughs> A long way round to say, go away and, if you've seen the film, go away and read the book for the absolute detail about war. I always have a section where I go to where in the world is the best. And we've been talking about war, and it seems a bit of an odd question as to where in the world is the best place to go to war, um, because war by its very nature is not a nice experience. But where in the world, in all the fantasy worlds, is the best experience of war? And I think perhaps looking here for grandeur, um, nobility, a sense of those around you supporting you. I wouldn't actually think the best place to go is Lord of the Rings because, in fact, the main characters all tend to get quite isolated during the battles. If you think about it, that Frodo and Sam are very much left on their own doing their effort. Pippin's on his own most of the time. Merry's on his own. Um, Aragorn manages to keep Gimli and Legolas and his Dunedain with him, but he's, he's quite lucky in that way. So I wouldn't think that actually the experience of war in The Lord of the Rings is that... Um, I think it's one of the more difficult ones. So I think if I had to be at war anywhere, I would choose to do it in the world of Harry Potter because if you're a wizard, it doesn't matter if you're good at you know how strong you are or anything like that. Your magic is what you're fighting with. And also you're surrounded by your friends in your school, in the case of the, the Hogwarts. And it's a very clear battle between good and evil. So I think if I had to choose a place to be part of a battle, I would be somewhere in, I don't know, Hufflepuff, <laughs> helping out in the final battle at Hogwarts. That's where I would go. So thank you very much for listening to this podcast. We've got some more episodes coming up soon with special guests. So do check back in and see what we are doing. But until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.